you can have a seat. Can we get up for our worship team and, man, leading us every single week. I love it. I love it. Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Um, I got to be honest with you. Some, someone asked me the other day, when you're a guest preacher, how do you determine what to, to preach from? And it's different every time. And this past time, when I found out I had the chance to preach this Sunday morning, I was riding home from Wednesday night, uh, youth, because we've opened up youth again on Wednesday night. So if you have a high school student, would love, love for your high school to be a part of what we do in here, 620 on Wednesday nights, uh, we start up. But I was leaving, I was like, Lord, what would you have me preach? And um, just kind of felt, just go to the Old Testament and preach something you never preached before. That's literally what I felt. And so the good thing is, Lance made the joke about me being nervous. I'm not nervous. I don't, if you know me, I just don't, I've never gotten nervous. And I think I would be nervous if I had to come up here and like invent something to say. You know what I mean? Like if I had to create something and content to say, I would probably be nervous whether you received it or not. But the good thing is when, when you preach the word as the best of my ability, I'm going to try to do that this morning, is God's word is just really good, right? God's word is good on its own. It's good whether you're in Genesis or Revelation or anywhere in between. And so if we open up his word and rightfully look into it, then, and it's better than anything I can say. Do you get that? And so, uh, so I love being able to preach the word confidently because of what God's word is. It's just so good. And so I, I want to give a shout out to Lance. Thank you him, to him for letting me be here this morning. Um, and shout out to you too. If you're here at church on Labor Day weekend, like go you. I just self-clap. Ten, you love Jesus, and I'm not going to pretend your vacation got canceled because of COVID, okay? Uh, so I'm going to pretend you love Jesus a lot. And then shout out to our online audience as well. So cool that they can worship the Lord with us together online. But before we dive in, I want to ask you um, this question that I genuinely want you to consider. And I want you to answer it because it's an important question for us. How do you come to trust people in your life? How, how do you come to trust people? Because all of us have people in our lives that we trust, don't we? Like we all do. So, so what is the criteria? What is the standard for saying, okay, this is a person that I can trust? Is it um, someone's recommendation? Like you ever met someone and they said, hey, this, this guy, you, you can trust him, Right. Like, is it someone's recommendation? Do you have, like, a day limit to where, like, if I meet you on day one, I don't trust you yet, but, like, 250 days in, boom, you have my trust. Is it that? Or uh, I know I was thinking about this question, and for me, it, it probably falls more along the lines of I, I need to go through something big with you right? And when I go through something big with you that's a, kind of a big life event, if you have my back in it and I can count on you through it, then kind of moving away from that, I'm like, okay, that's someone I can trust. How do you come to trust people in your life? Because let's just be honest, where you place your trust is a serious thing, isn't it? Like where you place your trust and who you place your trust in is a serious thing. Because I'm sure if we took the mic around, every single person in this room or, or watching online would be able to say, there was one moment when I placed my trust in a certain individual, and when I needed that individual, they did not come through for me. Anybody? Whether it was little or, or big, but there's people that have broken our trust. And so how do you come to trust someone? And, and in getting our minds thinking about that this morning, thinking that way, I want to stem from that and just ask this question. Why can you and I trust God? Why, like, how do we know that you and I serve a God whom we can trust? Is it just because he's God and, you know, spoke the earth into existence and is holding all things together. Like, like, is that how we know we can trust him or is it deeper than that? Because let's be honest, there's a lot of things that you and I can trust God with. Um, our families, our relationships, our education, shout out distance learning people, right? Uh, our, our jobs, our finances, our health, our future, our country, our, I mean, there's so many things. We could be up here forever talking about all the different things that we can possibly trust God with. And so I want us to answer the question this morning, how do we know how do we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, not question, not think through, not just I hope I can trust him. How do we know that we serve a God whom we can trust? And I think 1 Kings 17 answers that brilliantly for us. Now, I want to do something this morning reading through this. Is sometimes I like to like read the whole passage and then we kind of work our way back through it. I just kind of want to take this just verse at a time and, and let this story just uh, kind of develop before our eyes, if that's okay. Um, and so we're just going to read a couple verses here, a couple verses there, and we'll stop along the way as this story unfolds. Is that good with you? All right. If it's not, sorry. 
Um, <laughs> but hey, let's, uh, let's pray real quick, and then we'll dive into the word. Let's pray. Well, we love you, and uh, God, we're so, so incredibly grateful for the chance to gather and worship you this morning. Lord, I thank you for everyone, whether they're in this room, whether they're online. I thank you for the opportunity to worship you together. Lord, I pray that we just come before your word, understanding that we confess that we believe your word is true where it says that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but your word endures forever. So your word has something to say to our hearts this morning. So Lord, just empty me of me. Allow me to communicate this word as clearly as I possibly can. And Lord, I I pray that this morning we would be able to just feel this passage in such an incredible way. These are real people we're going to be reading about. This is a real event that happened. So help us not read it as just words on a page, but understand that this was a real woman. This was a real man. This was a real thing that happened. And Lord, help us to feel that this morning. We love you. God, we're thankful for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's start reading 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8. Verse 8. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him. The him there is Elijah, the prophet. We'll talk about him in a second. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked and only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now, listen to this, I am preparing a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. I think this morning it's going to help us to to step outside of this passage just for a second and understand kind of what's happening in this book. If if you were to read the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it is just what the name says. It's about the kings of Israel and Judah. And this is a history lesson for another day, but earlier in this book, the kingdom of Israel has split. You have the the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And and these kings that this book talks about, there's a common thread between all of them, or or I'll say between most of them. The, The Bible talks about 20 kings or so in the north of Israel, 20 kings or so in the south of Judah. And what we realize is that most of these kings are terrible kings, right? I know we've never had a bad politician ever, but they had some bad kings, right? Some terrible, terrible kings. But now here's what we need to understand, though, is that these kings were terrible, not necessarily in in earthly eyes. I mean, sometimes they grew in wealth. Sometimes they grew in political influence and political clout. Like they were, they were successful sometimes, but how many of you know that God's standard of success is different than the world's standard of success? And so sometimes these kings looked successful to the earthly, worldly eyes, but but they weren't being successful in God's standard. Because what we see, if you know the Old Testament, you know that the people were in bondage in Egypt, right? They're in bondage in Egypt, and God, with a mighty hand, hears, hears his people are in slavery. He sees them in bondage, and what does he do? He saves them. He redeems them. He brings them out of Egypt. And then they get to Mount Sinai where God gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them the law. And he says, because I've saved you, now that you're my people, there's a way that you should live. That's a good gospel reminder for us this morning is aren't you glad God didn't say, hey, here's the law. If you can live up to it, then I'll save you. Aren't you glad he didn't do that? Right? He saves them and says, because you're my people, this is how you should live live. And so God enters what we call a covenant with his people. But but what you see over all the Old Testament is the people are terrible. And and I emphasize terrible at living up to their end of the covenant. You you have God who's incredibly faithful, incredibly loving, incredibly merciful, providing, and then the people who are unfaithful to God. And the major way that we see this is they start worshiping idols, is that these kings that are listed in the book of First and Second Kings, they're, they're not leading the people to be faithful in their relationship with God, but they're leading the people to start worshiping other gods. And now I know right here there's a temptation for us in the Old Testament but because we're like, this is so old, this is so dated. Like, are we really, really like the, the people here in this passage? Because you might be sitting there thinking like, 
we, we don't really have idols in our homes, right? Like there's not a crafted idol that we bow down and worship to, right? There's not an idol that we, you know, sacrifice in front of every single day. And, and that might be true that we might not have a physical idol, but let's be honest, we have things competing for our attention, th- things competing for our affection, our devotion all the time in the place of God, don't we? Like there's so many things in our life that we can be quick to give financially to, but yet we shudder at giving anything to God when we come in church. I know that never gets amens, but am I right? I no problem spending money on other things, but 10%, oh my goodness, I can't do that. We have no problem giving our affection to other things, but yet we have a problem when it comes in here to get excited and we worship the Lord in here. We, we have no problem giving our devotion, and how about this? We have no problem giving our time to other things. Vast amounts of time to other things, and yet we reserve our leftover time to God. We might not have any physical idols, but I don't think we're that far off from these people in First Kings. Would you agree with me? Do we always have things vying for our attention? And so what God does is God raises up these men called the prophets. That's what we call them, the prophets, who come and they are speaking on behalf of God to to all the people, yes, but primarily to the kings, pointing out their sin and calling them to repent and turn back to love and adoration towards God and not other idols. And so Elijah in this story is one of these prophets. And Elijah has this enemy whose name is King Ahab. Go back and uh, if you've got your Bible, I'll read for you verse one of, seven, of chapter 17. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, that's the king of Israel. He said, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain these years except by my word. So so Elijah speaks as King Ahab, who has allowed idol worship to infiltrate the land, particularly idol worship of a God named Baal, B-A-A-L. He's allowed idol worship to permeate through the land. And and Elijah speaks to the king and says, because you've allowed this idol worship, God is going to judge you, waiting for you to return and repent to him. And there's not going to be rain or dew on the ground at all. Can I tell you kind of a fun Bible nerd here, uh, Bible nerd tip or whatever, is Baal, actually, they called Baal the rider of clouds, meaning that they believed Baal was the one who brought rain and Baal was the one who brought dew. So isn't it so cool that God says, hey, the thing that you think your false God is so good at, I'm gonna show you how much better I am than he is. Like, I don't know about you and me, but like when I go to attack someone or well, wait, we're in church, we never do that, right? We never do that. But, but if I hypothetically was trying to get under someone's skin, guess what I do? I look for a weakness, right? Like what's a weakness in that person? I, I'm so sinful, aren't I? Like, but isn't that what I do? Right? I go for a weakness. God says, I'll take your God's best strength and show you that I'm so much bigger than he is and he has nothing on me. And so that makes a lot of sense then while we read in verse 12 that this woman has prepared this food. She's saved up this food. And when Elijah asked for it, she's hesitant because she has saved up her food because there's been a drought in the land and she has run out of food. I think it's worth noting here one more time real quickly. That isn't it funny how Ahab's sin is affecting this woman? You notice that? Like the judgment is against Ahab and what Ahab's done in the kingdom. And it is having drastic ramifications for this woman. Let me just remind you, your sin never only affects you. It never only affects you. You, you might think that you have it hidden, but I guess what? If you have it hidden, it's affecting the way you love your family. It's affecting the way students that you honor your parents, that you do. Your sin never affects only you. And this woman is experiencing a hardship because of this drought. Can we put ourselves in our shoes this morning for a second? Like, we never know her name. The the Bible says she's just the widow. She's a widow. We don't know her name. We don't know who she is. But but parents in this room, me me and my wife, we're, we're not parents yet. But I can only imagine what she has gone through the last few months, last few weeks, whatever. Because can you imagine when the the drought started and they started to kind of predict like, hey, this this drought might last a little while. Immediately, because think about this, if if there's no rain, that means the harvest is not as good. If the harvest is not as good, then that means Walmart's not stocked up, right? That means means the the food is eventually going to run out. And so can you imagine as she's sitting there and maybe she's trying to predict what it's going to be like and she says, okay, I need to start kind of rationing my food a little bit. 
because we can't just eat like normal because this stuff is going to run out. And maybe I wonder if it was like a COVID like thing where I remember like March 18th was like, oh yeah, we're going to be shut down for like four or five weeks. And then it's six months later, right? Like I wonder if that was it for her where she's like, maybe it's not going to be that long, but weeks after weeks after weeks go by. And can you imagine, especially you moms in the room, can you imagine where she's a single mother providing for her son and every day she goes and looks at the pantry and it's getting less and less and less. And if you're a parent and you have kids, what's like your primary job? Provide for your kids, right? R raise your kids, lead your kids, provide for them. And yet this mom is struggling in this drought because she's supposed to be the source of provision for her son. But every time she goes and looks at the pantry, it's getting less and less and less. And she knows if something crazy doesn't happen that she and her son are going to die. What, what was that last week like? As, as she could probably measure out her food and know, okay, we have six days left. We, we have five days left. We, we have two days left. Can you imagine the emotional turmoil this mom must have been going through? Like, how, how do you, think about this, parents. How do you have that conversation with your son? Like, like we don't know how old this boy was. We don't know. We know in a few seconds, Elijah picks him up. So he's, must not have been crazy big, but we don't know how old he was, but how do you have that conversation? Like, mom, I want food. Listen, after tomorrow, we, we're not going to have any food. Is that not heavy? That this woman is preparing to die. And apparently, verse 12 says she's come to grips with it, hasn't she? While she's preparing sticks, she's got her stuff because she said we are going to enjoy our last meal together. And then after this, we are just prepared. We've accepted it. We are going to die. Now, if I was Elijah, I would probably think this. Because remember, God commands Elijah to go find the widow. Remember that when we just read it? If I was Elijah, you know what my first thought is? I found the wrong widow. Right? Like, I found the wrong one. Like, God, there, there must be a couple widows in here because surely, God, surely you're not going to make me go to the woman who's about to die. Like, surely you're not going to make me ask of this woman who has very, very little resources to give me some of her last stuff. Like, surely, God, that's not the woman you have for me. But look at what Elijah says in verse 13. And Elijah said, do not fear. Okay, um, fear is the only option that makes sense for her right now. So that's kind of a, a weird command, but do not fear. And look at what he does. Go and do as you have said. But first, the audacity here, I love it. Make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. I'm like, Elijah, did you just hear what she just said? Like she has no food left. Like they're just about to go and enjoy their last meal together. And yet you, you're supposed to be a compassionate man of God, Right? You're supposed to be a loving man of God, like just enjoy your, your food. Go on and just enjoy your last meal with your son. He says, before you eat some, let me have some of it. See, this, this just strikes me how intense this question is and how hard it must have been for her to give up her food. Because I remember there was a time me and my wife over here, Courtney, my better half, we were dating at Anderson University. All right, that's where we went to college at. And she has no idea I'm going to tell this story. And I'm so excited because we love this story. Um, we were dating at Anderson University and now we were at the grill for lunch. It's a place called The Grill where you could get like grilled cheese, hot dogs, hamburgers, and fries and all this stuff. And so we were at The Grill and I had her meet me there. And I walk in and I, every now and then, every now and then at The Grill, the Holy Spirit moved on the cook in some way. And instead of placing fries out, they placed tater tots out. How many tater tot fans in here? And listen, I don't even like tater tots more than I like fries. It was just something about, like, there was no rhyme or reason. You went in thinking you were going to get fries, and all of a sudden you get tater tots, and it was just a glorious day, right? And, uh, and so I walk in, walk in the door, and as soon as I look over, I see the tater tots, right? And I'm like, yes, this is my moment. So I walk up, and I get my food, get my tater tots, and I come back to the table. Now, I'm like, any, any Friends fans in here? The show, Friends? We can be non-Christians for just a second, Friends? Okay. Um, when Joey's like, Joey doesn't share food. Anybody? That's me, right? Like, I, I don't share food. You order what you need to order, I order what I need to order, and then let's do it. Now, if you want to share with me, with me your food, I'll take it. But I ain't sharing my food. But I knew, I knew that I needed to be a good boyfriend. Like, I knew that this was probably going to be my wife one day, and I was like, I want, I want to be good. I want to do what I'm supposed to do. And so we got a full basket of tater tots, and I said, Courtney, I said, do you want a tater tot? She said no. And I'm like, okay, I did my job. Right here we go. Like, that's this is all mine. And I don't know about you, ladies in this room. I don't know if you can uh, identify with this, but men, I'm a strategic eater. 
Does anyone know what I'm talking about already? Like, I'm a strategic eater. If I know I'm going to my favorite restaurant at night, I will starve myself throughout the day, right? Or, or if I know I got this basket of tater tots, I'm not going to rush through them at the very beginning. I'm going to save five or six to savor them at the end, right? That's just how, anybody else relating with me? Just, am I, am I a freak? Just me? Okay. I'm a strategic eater, so I get there and I finish my whole food, get down to the last little bit of tater tots. I got two left, right? Two left, and I'm just emotionally preparing for the last one. This is going to be the last one, and I don't know when I'm going to get them again. So I grab the second to last one, I eat it, and I look up, and suddenly my wife's hand emerges from under the table. (laughs) Grabs the last tater tot. And for a second, I thought she was going to, like, present it to me. Like, it's your last one. Enjoy it. She takes it. puts it in her mouth and eats it. And I'm looking at her like, (laughs) she looks at me, she's like, what? And I'm like, you took my last one. Like you could have taken the first one. I'm cool with that. You could have taken one from the middle. I'm cool with that. You could have taken the second, the last one. But how dare you, woman, take my last one that I was emotionally prepared for. That was when I knew though I could marry her because I stayed with her, right? That's when I knew. But there's something about when you are saving it for the last bite and someone sneaks, snatches in and grabs it. And, and that's just me being petty. But this is this woman's life. I mean, that's just me being petty, wanting to enjoy just some food. Right? This is this woman's livelihood. And yet when she has nothing left, just barely a little, Elijah, this man of God, swoops in and says, hey, the last bit you have before you make it for yourself, just give me some. Isn't it hard when you feel the Spirit of God moving on you to give something, but you don't feel like you have anything to give? Moving on you to to help someone, and you don't have hardly, or you don't feel like you have anything to help them with. That's where she is. But look at this woman of faith. Her, man, I wish we knew her name. The Bible never tells her, but it's amazing. Because look at what it says. He says, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, verse 14, the jar of flour shall not be spent And the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. You you know what I'm I'm learning more and more in life? Is that for me, one of the biggest battles I face as a Christian, one of the biggest battles that I continually face as a follower of Christ is if I'll answer this question correctly. Will I trust in what I see or will I trust in what God says? Yo, that's hard. Because think about this. He literally tells her, go, go make me some food. And if you do that, then tomorrow you're going to have enough for yourself. Then the next day you'll have enough. I, I, can you just imagine she got home? I, I got to imagine. She, she got home, she looked in the jar and said, like, how in the world is this supposed to happen? Like that doesn't make any sense, right? That you're going to use it and then it's going to keep being filled up. You're going to use it, but there's going to keep being more the next day. But she trusts, oh, I love her faith. She trusts what the word of the Lord says. And look at what she says in verse 15. Look at what she did. It says that she went and did as Elijah said. And she and her household ate for many days. And the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. You know what's so cool about this passage? Your little in the hand of God becomes a lot. Your little in the hand of God becomes a lot. And maybe, maybe it wasn't a lot for her. Like I, the Bible doesn't say that the jar was overflowing, but it was enough. It was enough for her every single day. What does Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. What if we changed our prayers from that to praying, God, would you bless me for weeks out? And Jesus says, no, I'm just going to sustain you day by day. That's a different kind of prayer, isn't it? But she trusts God with a little, and what does God keep doing? He keeps on filling it up. And maybe some of us are struggling to trust God with little things in our life because the rest of the world seems like it's going crazy, and we have our grasp on just a little bit, and we're so unwilling to give it up and trust him. But he's saying, if you just trust me with what you think is a little, he says, I'll be sufficient for you every single day. Her little becomes a lot in the hand of God. Now, let's just be honest. Um, We want to stop and kind of, sing there, don't we? Like, isn't that a good moment, like, to stop, like, the sermon and, and rejoice? Like, isn't that, like, you know, when God, when you use a little bit, God blesses you with plenty and all that stuff. Like, that's a good time to sing Waymaker, Darrell, isn't it? Like, that's, that's a good time to, to do this, right? But this is why you should never just read, like, passages of the Bible in isolation. 
right? Like if you're reading the Bible on your own, like, like I wouldn't just stop there. Because look at what, what happens in verse 17. Look at this. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house. Now, we have a weird definition of that word. This just means she's in charge of the house, right? She, she's the most important woman there because her husband has died, right? But her son became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Do you get the drama that just unfolded there? Like she just saw God provide in an amazing way. She was so emotionally prepared to literally have a last meal with her son and die. But God showed up took what she had was just a little, and God supplied her needs every single day. God shows up in a major way. So imagine the shift that just happened in her mind. Because on one hand, she's preparing to die with her son, but then God starts providing moms. Can you imagine? She's probably sitting there thinking, man, I'm actually going to get to see my son grow up. I'm actually, I thought we were going to die. I'm going to get to see him get get married, have kids. I'm going to get to see all of these things. God provided for her in one season, but then in the next, her son whom God just miraculously saved, gets sick and dies. It's almost like, God, did you save my son just to kill him a few days later? And now we talk about how we sometimes think the Old Testament's not relevant. How many of you for us have ever been in a moment where it's like God was supplying every need for me, he was meeting every need, and he was working in my life, I could see him working, and then all of a sudden next week I'm like, God, I'm still here, what is going on? That's where she's at. And I can't blame her anger. I can't blame her frustration because she cries out. And she's like, Elijah, like, what is happening here? What, what is going on that God would save my son a few days earlier, but now he's put to death? Now, talk about not seeing God work. <laughs> we just sang it, right? That's true, though, isn't it? To talk about not seeing God work. And so look at what happens. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, oh, Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon this widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? You know what I love there? Elijah has no idea what's going on either. You catch that? I tell you, it's funny. Uh, Irvin, you probably agree with me on this. So many people come up as like you have pastor in your title. It's like, hey, what's God doing in my life? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's not like I'm on a conference call with him every week. That he, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, that doesn't happen. I can point you to the word. But, like, people come asking for answers all the time. And I'm like, I don't know what God's doing. And I love, I love here that Elijah's like, God, what's up? Like, why are you doing what you're doing? But I love, oh, I love verse 21. Y'all just got out of a series of dangerous prayers, right? And that was just got out of. I don't want to re-preach that, but look at what he says right here. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. You talk about a bold prayer. You talk about a bold prayer where this lifeless son is laying on this bed, a situation that everyone else would have said was hopeless. A situation where everyone said, well, God just didn't show up there. God just didn't do nothing there. And yet Elijah, the man of God, stretches himself out over this boy and says, Lord, would you breathe life into him again? That's a bold prayer. And maybe there's some of us that need to take a page from Elijah's book today, and we need to start praying for things that we thought were dead. We need to start praying for things again that we thought God was, was done with. Maybe you've been praying for your son or your daughter, and you thought that God is just, I man, I guess God's not going to answer it. I guess God's not going to do nothing. No, no, no. He can still do something. He, he can still move. We need to start praying that again. Maybe you had such a burden for someone who didn't know Jesus and still does not know the Lord. I mean, you prayed for years and years, and yet they've still not come to faith in Christ. Let's not stop praying for them. Well, let's not stop praying for situations in our life that that we think are done and that we think are dead for because God might say no. He he might say no, not yet, but he just might hear us and say yes because look at what it says in verse 22. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again and he revived. Now, I know it's just words on a page, but y'all, he just came back to life. That's crazy. 
that's unbelievable. And we're so distant from it. Sometimes we just read it and we're like, oh, he came back to life. No, when have you ever seen a dead person come back to life? That's crazy what just happened. Yeah, God did it. And I love what happens in verse 23. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber and into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. You know, I love um, reaction videos. Like when a, a soldier comes home from war and they surprise someone, right? Those like get me every time. Uh, or extreme home makeover, throwback, right? When they would do the house and remove the thing and they get to see their home. And the, the first camera shot's never on the home, it's on the family, right? Um, or when a, bro- a groom sees his bride coming down the aisle. For, I love stuff like that. Can you imagine this woman's reaction? Like parents in this room, how would you have responded? Like your, your son just died. He disappears to the upper room with Elijah. And I mean, I don't know what that moment was like for her downstairs, but that was probably not her best moment ever. And all of a sudden you hear footsteps and you think it's just Elijah, but down the steps comes your son. What was that moment like? As her son was brought back to life. And I love, I love what she says in response. Because remember, we're asking the question, how do you and I know we can trust God? How do you know we can trust him? Look at what her response is. So good. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know. Not I hope. Not I think. Not not I'm pretty certain. Not I have good grounds to, to believe this. She says, now I know that you are a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Listen to me. She did not know that Elijah was a man of God after the flour and after the oil never ran out. She doesn't come to that conclusion then. She she doesn't come to the conclusion that Elijah is a man of God as her and him are probably sitting there having countless conversations over the dinner table. She doesn't come to that conclusion then. But when her dead son is raised back to life, listen, when resurrection happens... She looks at him and says, surely, surely you are a man of God. And the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. And what's amazing, what's amazing is this is all happening against the backdrop of a country that's worshiping false gods. We're worshiping this God named Baal and God shows up and he says, this idol that you've been worshiping has no authority. This idol that you're worshiping has no power, has no control, has no ultimate say, but I am the God who can take something that was dead and breathe life into it again. We serve a God of resurrection. How does she know that she can trust him? How does she know that she can trust his word? Because her son was once dead but now he's alive because resurrection happened. And here's what I will argue. I will argue this to the day I die. Our assurance that we can trust God Your assurance that you can trust God with the little things in your life, with the big things in your life, with everything in between, our assurance that we can trust God is not that much different from this woman's. Our reason we can trust him is not that different because why? What does the Bible say in Galatians chapter four? In the fullness of time, God sent his son. John chapter one, that the word became flesh, dwelt among us. And what's amazing is when you look at Jesus's ministry, you know who they thought Jesus was? A lot of people thought Jesus was like Elijah reborn because he's doing these amazing things. I mean, he's making deaf people hear. He's making lame people walk. He's making blind people see, calming the storms, walking on water, feeding thousands. Many people were thinking that this is just some kind of Elijah reborn. He even made dead people come back to life again, didn't he? Go go ask Lazarus about that. But what is amazing is what happens in Jesus' story. What happens in his life? He is betrayed. He's falsely accused. He is hung on a cross for your sins and for mine. He dies the most brutal death that the world has ever known, the most humiliating death. And they bury him in a tomb. What's the reaction of the disciples after that moment? Is it it one of faith or is it one of fear? It's, It's fear, right? It's discouragement. It's, well, I thought this guy was able to do all this stuff and he did all these amazing things and I thought he was... I thought he was the Savior. I thought he was the Messiah. I thought he was the Christ, but now he's dead in a tomb. What happened, church family? 
for the disciples who were fearful and discouraged in an upper room, scared to do anything. What happened from going from there to, to Peter preaching in front of thousands at Pentecost? What, what happened from going from there where they were all fearful for their life to literally every disciple giving their life for Christ to where they would die the ultimate death for following Jesus? What happened? Resurrection happened. Resurrection happened. That this Jesus that they served, they saw him die. They saw him do amazing things. They saw him do incredible things, walk on water, make blind people see, lame people, you know, all these things. But when they saw that Jesus rose from the grave, they knew that they could trust him. They knew that he was someone worth following. They, they knew that he was someone worth giving everything for. They knew that he was someone worth laying down their life for. See, resurrection changes everything. Changes everything. So I would argue that our story is no different from the widow. Our story is no different from the disciples. Because listen, you, you can trust God with your resources. You, you can trust God with your children. You, you can trust God with your job. You can trust God with your finances. You can trust God with your future. You can trust God. We can play Mad Lib all day and you can fill anything in the blank. You can trust him with all that. Why? Because he's the God of resurrection. You say, Justin, how does that tie in? If you and I can trust God, if I can trust God enough that one day I'm going to close my eyes in death, and yet I trust him that he is going to raise me up from the grave again, how can I trust him with that but not trust him with a few dollars? How can I trust him with resurrection but not trust him with my family? How can I trust him with that but not trust him with my health? How can I trust him with resurrection but not with every single moment of every single day of my life. This widow, it wasn't the oil that confirmed it. It wasn't the flower that confirmed it. It was when resurrection happened. She said, I can trust this man. If you're here today and you feel like you have so many things going on in your life and you're like, man, I just, Justin, I can't trust God. I can't trust him because these things are too heavy. These things are too big. Ain't none of them bigger than Jesus being laid in the tomb and he beat that. He beat that. Resurrection changes everything. It is how you and I can answer the question. Why, why can you trust God? Because Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Because he rose again. Yeah, you can clap. That's fine. We'll clap. I'm keep talking. He rose again. And he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he may die, he too shall live. I can trust him with everything. I can trust him with everything. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? How many of you Christians in the room? I just want to know so I can pray for you. If you're online, don't check out here. Stay on for just a few more seconds and be a part of this time together. How many Christians, though, in this room or watching online? I just want to know so I can pray for you. Nobody looking around. I just want to pray with you and pray for you. How many of you needed to be reminded, Justin, I serve a God in whom I can trust? I can trust him. I need to be reminded of this morning. If that's you, just raise your hand because life's been going crazy and you're like, man, I'm struggling with trusting him. But Justin, today I needed that reminder. I can trust him with everything. Amen. Amen. I see all those hands. Thank you so much. I, I want to encourage you. I say this a lot when I do times like this, but sometimes the enemy would tempt us and we can tempt ourselves and begin to think on our own that, you know what? I'm the only one struggling with trusting God. And makes us feel like such a bad Christian. Christian, this room was full of hands. I'm sure people were thinking this online, that there's so many of us struggling with that. Believer, I pray that this morning was an encouraging, an encouragement to you to know, to know that you serve a God in whom you can place all of your trust, all of your trust. But maybe you're here this morning and you're like, Justin, I, I can't trust God. I can't trust Jesus because I'm not following Jesus. I'm, I'm not following him. I've never once turned from my sin, placed my faith and trust in him. Can I just tell you, person in this room, person watching online, what we talked about, Jesus suffering and dying, that was for you. The, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and that's what you and I owed, but Jesus paid your debt, and he paid mine. And you say, Justin, this morning, I need to follow Christ for the first time. 
I need to turn my sin and, and I, I can't trust him with my daily walk because I've not yet trusted him with my salvation. And today I need to place my trust in him. Maybe you don't even know what that looks like yet, but you're just like, Justin, I know I'm not following Jesus and I need to today. If that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed and online, you participate here too. If that's you, would you raise your hand? If you say, Justin, I'm not following Jesus, but I know that I need to. I know that I'm not and I need to. The Bible says if you just call upon the name of the Lord, you'd be saved. Raise your hand online if you're in the comment section. And if that's you in this room, and I want you to come find us afterwards and we can show you your next step. We can show you your next step. Jesus, we love you. We love you. Lord, we're so thankful that you're the God of resurrection. You're the God who's in the business of taking dead things and bringing them to life. That's every Christian's in this room story. We weren't bad people that you've made better. We were people who were dead in our sin and you've made us alive. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you. Help us to be reminded if we can trust you with that, then we can trust you with anything, with anything. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for the hope the resurrection brings. In your name we pray, amen, amen.